When I was in middle school, I vividly remember when I received my first gaming PC. I remember being overjoyed and thrilled to where I didn't waste a second and immediately went to download the games I've always wanted to play, such as Half-Life or Left 4 Dead. Games that I'd sink so many hours into that I had a blast playing and will never forget. This only opened the door to a plethora of genres that I explore at my disposal on the Steam market, to go out and about to my heart's desire, to find new interests that would see me out of my comfort zone. Because of this huge list of overwhelming games, I find games that met my taste, but also old games that I never imagined I'd ever see myself playing. One of these would be the survival horror genre. This introduced me to a Resident Evil remake, a part of the GameCube version that was updated and remastered for modern platforms, that I'd sunk so many hours into with its easy approach to replayability throughout each playthroughs. The player would find themselves in. Because of this, I want to seek more in this survival horror genre, and that I did. I grew a fondness and a love for this genre. And because of this, I want to go back to a much more simpler time. A time when I was back in high school, playing these games that I not only found playing on my own, but also played with others online in various multiplayer games in the genre. But in these efforts, I came to find that many of these multiplayer games that I have a vague memory of playing have become dead over the years. Their once and up and rising community has slowly trickled down in numbers and has slowly become desolate. An afterthought with the likes of the masses that is more popular multiplayer games that are favored compared to the latter. Purely for nostalgia's sake, I want to explore these once small and lively horror games that were previously active long ago and explore them as much as possible with ones that I grew familiar with back in the day, but also new ones I've never heard before. So if you will, join me as we venture into this world of exploring dead horror games on Steam. If you were a kid who was born during the 2000s, it's likely that you were prone to inevitably stumble upon the popular horror figure that everyone was raving about during the 2010s, Slenderman. This tall, lengthy, and skinny figure that wore a dapper suit along with white pale skin was one of the most iconic scary tales you'd come to find during the rise of the YouTuber Let's Play phenomenon. You come to find the YouTuber in question screaming obnoxiously during their walkthrough with the obligatory jump scare while roaming in this vast empty environment while trying to find these eight pages as the primary objective, whilst avoiding the antagonist Slenderman from capturing you and resulting in a game over. This was nostalgic in itself if you were someone who was witness to that era of horror games. It was a sight to behold and worth remembering for those who experienced it back in its formative years, to nowadays with this dramatic shift in horror games. However, I imagine there is one question you must be asking yourself. What does this have to do with the video? Well. With the success of Slender, the 8 pages, it was only inevitable that you'd come to find many Slenderman clones that would copy and paste the gameplay mechanics, the presentation, and the overall concept of Slender, the 8 pages, by creating something of their own before that success would die out. The Slenderman clone in particular is White Noise Online. Without a doubt, if one person were to interject with a Slenderman clone that pays lots of tribute and attention to the source material word for word, it would have to be this game in particular. I actually remember this game being a household name for many of those who were primarily playing on the Xbox 360 back in the day. I played with my childhood friends together, whether at each other's house or respectively online with other people. It was essentially everything that comprised Slender, the 8 pages, and its gameplay mechanics, visual slash sound design, and overall presentation down to the core. The only slight difference is that of the cast of characters and the antagonist itself being a dumbed, watered-down version of the aforementioned Slenderman. It was set in stone that the developer, Milkstone Studios, was trying to replicate that success of Slender by paying much of that creative liberty on their end and doing everything in its power to paint that success for itself with their take on the formula. I will say it's rather excusable for this iteration of the Slenderman clone because this was not necessarily a game that was supposed to be specifically orientated towards Steam on the PC platform. If anything, that's just a perk, but rather made specifically catered to the Xbox 360 players who, at the time before the release of Slender, the arrival, would have to resort to the plethora of Slenderman clones on the market in favor of the lacking poor of the PC game that is Slender the 8 pages. This was basically the poor man's slender experience, but I would be lying if it weren't a good one. So, color me surprised when undergoing research for this video, and how I found that this would be also available on Steam. 
While looking at this, I want to see if there was a dedicated player base for this game, even if it was over a decade old. But much to my misfortune, while looking at the Steam Community tab, I found nothing. Not a single three-digit number was in the 100s to signify that there was a hint of life. Curiosity struck me. I wanted to check the discussion forums to see if there were people still active amongst each other when it came to want to find others to see if people were still interested in playing the game. And there was. There were lots of threads of people asking if there were those interested in whether this was a game that was still active or dead entirely. I even found someone who, much like myself, agreed that White Noise Online was primarily for the Xbox 360 during its time and not really for the PC platform. This was very wholesome, but at the same time, bittersweet, to see how drastically low this player base was during its overall life cycle, and to see that not even a fraction made up what I imagined was the Xbox 360 player base back in the day. But I've been talking a lot about the history of this game, so let's dive into the actual game itself. Once in the main menu, you'll find the option of choosing between either an online multiplayer game or a single player game. I knew what the outcome would be with its non-existent active players, but I want to assure myself, and lo and behold, zero players were online. Unfortunately, much to my dismay. Fortunately though, there was the option to play solo on your own, with the option to choose the character of your choosing, as well as the map and the difficulty. It seems that each character has a unique quality to their stats that distinguishes them from the rest of the characters to give it a bit of replay value within each session. I do think having options for some sort of custom ability and your gameplay approach is somewhat innovative. There are maps to explore that are either large in their spectacle or enclosed in this claustrophobic atmosphere. Upon starting, your objective will always be to find 8 tape recordings to collect throughout this traversal on the map while avoiding the slender-like creature, or at least, according to the White Noise Wiki, Subject 23. Everything after this basic synopsis is essentially word for word slender in one's exploration of finding these various tape recordings scattered across the map where you will see the player having to use mostly their flashlight to illuminate the path before you to know where you're going as the environment is very dark. If there's any intuitive gameplay design, there isn't much at all whatsoever, as you'll mostly be walking aimlessly in this unknown and obscure environment that will mostly be based on experience rather than luck. The enemy's AI behavior mostly works off of the amount of tapes that the player collects. If you collect one, then the AI will start to progressively become more aggressive as you explore throughout the map. The more you collect, the more it becomes frequent in its appearance. There is no retaliation through combat, but rather having to use your sense of sound by listening to the ambience for any clues of Subject 23's whereabouts, as well as the tape recording playing in the distance. If you find yourself looking directly at Subject 23, then you'll find the screen around you become more vibrant in its yellow hue, and start to frequently become violent in its static and sound, which is an audio and visual indicator to escape immediately and avoid contact at all costs. Whether that's running away or hiding behind an object, which results in Subject 23 teleporting away. This is the general gist of the overall gameplay mechanics, and nothing more or nothing less to it. It's very repetitive in its nature, it doesn't capitalize on this gameplay design to give any incentive to try something new in your approach to facing the monster or the emphasis on exploration in your environment. And if it does, it's through the other characters as the character of your choosing is predestined with a quality that isn't customizable. So much of the time, you'll have to basically rely on memorization of the tape recordings and specific locations throughout the map in hopes of being lucky and collecting all of them as the moment you collect one or more of them the timer starts to count down with the enemy AI becoming more aggressive and frequent in its appearances as previously mentioned. One can argue that it is the point of the gameplay concept as you're supposed to play this game of hide and seek, but it's heavily dampened down by the uninspired atmosphere where it looks very unpolished and unfinished, the locations becoming formulaic and repetitive in its design, and its intrusive control scheme that makes its exploration a slog and pain to get through. Much of my enjoyment was heavily hindered by the mouse sensitivity being painfully slow to direct the player's trajectory of where they are facing in the general direction they are looking at, while moving left to right, which was anything but seamless. Even upping the mouse sensitivity to its maximum setting wasn't enough to avoid this awkward and clunky camera movement. 
so much of the gameplay, you'll see me struggle to move the player's camera movement to where I am facing. It's pretty obvious that at the end of the day, Why Noise Online was never meant to be played alone by yourself. Sure, it's available, which is a nice added perk if you have the means to do so, to test yourself when it comes to wanting a challenge without the help of others. But the point of the game is to be experienced with friends or players online, which is what comprises much of that magic that you come to find back in the day. It's in the name of the game, after all. Without it, it feels very empty and hollow. It's tragic, really. I want to go into this with a wave of nostalgia that would splash down over me with this recollection of memories that were heartfelt and wholesome in my experience, to replicate what I once felt with my childhood friends. But all I felt was loneliness in a dead and abandoned game that was lost to time and lacked any sense of life. It was a nice trip down memory lane, admittedly, but without that dedicated player base of finding players online, even if it's a small fraction of what it used to be, it's not worth playing this game on your own. And honestly, probably not worth playing at all, whatsoever. I'll never forget the memories I forged back in the day, and will always treasure what I once had during my time when this game was still alive. One of the more underrated horror games that is free to play that not many people know about is Dark Deception. A horror game that takes the concept of the horror maze and manipulates it to become a terrifying, heart-pounding race to collect the purple shards before the killer ends up capturing you, resulting in a game over. It's essentially Pac-Man, but if it were in a first-person horror game. This creates lots of tension and pressure on the player, even with such limitations to these mechanics, where all you really do is run around whilst avoiding the pursuer and all your efforts. You have to resort to using sound cues to know when the enemy is nearby. And you also need the handy tablet on your left to know how many purple shards you have left. Even with this horror element that comprises much of this gameplay, it makes a good time waster out of your day if you want something fun but also have that adrenaline rush. Much of these creative liberties will be taken into account by the developer, Glowstick Entertainment. This indie development studio would find massive success with this little hidden gem that they have on their hands and make a franchise out of it. This leads to the multiplayer game, Dark Reception, Monsters and Mortals being one of them, along with a demake called Super Dark Deception. The focus, however, is solely on the multiplayer component as it features much of that hide-and-seek gameplay, but greatly expands upon it incorporating the likes of combat as being a big one to battle against the monsters as well as the mortals which the player assumes while in a match. Having item boxes that randomize these items can be used either in your favor or against the other players to collect more purple shards. These are some of the primary elements that come to mind when speculating the differences made in contrast to Dark Deception's more limited gameplay design, where combat was never an option, rather hiding from your pursuer. So, it seems that much of the gameplay design is seen here. But the question is, how does it hold up? Well, to try my experience, it was rather a welcome surprise to find other people still playing this multiplayer game. However, there weren't many people, especially when you look on Steam charts, which shows the average number of players monthly, as well as the all-time peak not being much either, a shockingly low amount, which resulted in, at the time I was playing, only 15 people. This created a bit of dismay on my part, as I was expecting to wait for an excruciatingly long time, whilst waiting for a match in the lobby. However, I luckily was in a match in progression, with four other players waiting, which quickly had a turnaround time that saw a complete lobby of six. We spawned in one of the many maps in the gameplay that saw us in the sewers. The gameplay works essentially by having one player spawn as a monster, while the other five players are mortals. The mortals have to find and collect the purple shards while avoiding contact with the monster, that is constantly pursuing them and also other mortals that can sabotage them by killing them. Hindering their performance could cause them to lose a fraction of their total purple shards. So, in a way, it's essentially a battle royale of sorts, where everyone is pitted against each other to see the last one standing with the most purple shards. It's an interesting twist on the formula where instead of working together, you are forced to battle against each other, amplifying these stakes as a mortal as you have to worry about other mortals attacking you as well as the monsters too.
Much of the time during my gameplay session, I found myself just trying to collect as many purple shards as possible, while also exploring this expansive and grandiose sewer layout, as it was massive in scale. So I saw lots of confusion about where to go, as the layout was much of the same in its presentation. It also doesn't help that I found myself dying a lot of the time to other players, who were most likely higher in rankings compared to me, as they perpetually kept fighting me in hopes of killing me off. There isn't much detail nor innovation in this combat, however, as it is just mostly spamming attacks with your mouse while trying to hopefully land your hits on the other player. The damage output is very slim and doesn't make much of an impact, as this could see the players taking a very long time to battle each other, much like you see here with me in combat. Combat, in general, is just very clunky and repetitive, and doesn't give much incentive for growth on the player's behalf, to allow for this improvement on their part, nor the ability to build upon it with new mechanics that could be unlocked and implemented or maybe see other weapons variety for the sake of custom ability. This comes off as counterintuitive, because I did see another player with a pair of scissors that dealt a lot of damage to me and killed me instantly. However, I'm assuming that this difference in weapon variety is through character skins, a feature that is on the storefront of the Steam page for the game itself, albeit at the expense of microtransactions. If that's the case, then I think that's a bit of a lackluster excuse for a variety of this gameplay design, as well as laziness. But even then, the aforementioned combat is very weak and not much to be amazed about, as once again, you're just relentlessly mashing your mouse button to attack other players, assuming the role of the monster isn't any better either, as you're just committing the same actions verbatim. That doesn't feel much different when assuming the role of a mortal. The difference I did come to find here is when another mortal is killed off, they join the monsters, which, ironically, sees the monsters teaming up together to take down the mortals. But there isn't anything else to go off of this that added incentive to want to be the role of a monster. Other than that, there just wasn't much else to do in monsters and mortals. There are a variety in its maps and character roster, but it doesn't expand upon this intuitively with any gameplay mechanics that can be built upon this. And if there is, you have to purchase other characters via microtransactions, if you want a new incentive for gameplay to be changed up and fresh. As it was a dead game, I tried to join back once again to play in another lobby, but unfortunately, I had to wait for a good 15 to 20 minutes, just to hopefully get a full match of 6 people going. I almost did get a match, but it resulted in the server being lost as the server owner left, leaving me to just my thoughts and no motive to continue playing, especially if I had to wait for a prolonged period of time to play another match. I think there is potential for monsters and mortals to be something bigger, especially if these collaborations of these survival horror franchises with the likes of Silent Hill, for example. However, the lack of innovation in its design and inattentive detail in the matchmaking leaves this game just not worth playing anymore. One of the more prolific subgenres in the horror genre is undoubtedly hide and seek horror. It rose to prominence with the release of Amnesia The Dark Descent, cementing this gameplay mechanic where the player will find themselves hiding from the pursuer, an enemy that is out to kill you throughout this level progression, that will demand you to have to hide for the sake of your survival. Combat is usually never an option in these games, so the idea of hiding from the enemy as opposed to fighting back is a gratifying concept that caught much attention at the time. It gave this vulnerability, which encompassed much of this pressure and tension, not only creating this immersive atmosphere, but also giving an everlasting impression on the survival horror genre. This brings us to our next multiplayer horror game, Hide and Shriek. This is one of the older games that was once upon a time popular among streamers who used to stream themselves alongside YouTubers, recording their reactions to their gameplay shenanigans. It's pretty clear that this game was marketed towards that push to that audience, which I'm assuming is for the sake of publicity, but also sales. And to an extent, this worked for its time. But looking at the players online nowadays, it's strikingly dead from any sort of activity that it once used to have. But regardless of this fact, it still has a somewhat decently active player base. Colored me surprised when I found out the low player count didn't hinder my experience of actually getting a couple of in-game matches going. In gameplay, you'll come to find a 1v1 matchup against another player, who sees either of you competing to acquire these orbs. Typically, they're color-orientated towards the player in question, which will have you to try to collect as many as possible in this school environment. 
You'll have to roam around each classroom to explore and open cabinets or drawers to uncover any of these orbs and place them on an altar. In doing so, you'll also have to find various runes that are essentially power-ups to use as an advantage and against your opponent. These runes have a surprising amount of depth behind them, where you can find yourself using runes that could give you a boost in sprinting, using a radar-like function to detect hidden orbs in your general vicinity, and much more. Other than that, this is basically the overall idea when it comes to hide and shriek. To be completely honest, I find that in the first couple of matches, it can give a sense of adrenaline because of the time limit that pressures the player into undergoing these tasks at hand. To find these orbs while also evading or defending against the other player, who is doing their best to sabotage you via the runes or a jump scare. But after doing this same process and consecutive matches, you come to find that there isn't anything else to do in this gameplay. After some time, I came to realize that the other opponent was non-existent at least in the context of them being visible, and I mostly just felt alone and by myself in the school setting, just perpetually collecting orbs to bring back to the altar, while also having to find runes that I used haphazardly in hopes of it being genuinely effective and worthwhile. But in the end, I saw really nothing of value through this repetition. There was trial and error on my part, as I constantly got jump scared or got hindered by the opponent with their power-ups, which saw me lose much of the time. But I didn't gain any value or experience as to how to be better in my sessions. Even if I did learn how to master the gameplay fundamentals, there isn't much of a point here. The gameplay never builds upon this, it mostly just stays the same and sees you in the same environment, doing the same process, rinse and repeat. A new setting that isn't just the same for classrooms would have added at least a bit of variety, as it becomes old and stale after a while. Maybe show the other opponent once in a while to at least have an idea as to where the location is instead of feeling lonely in this atmosphere, where it makes me feel like I'm playing by myself when the point is to see my opponent and combat against them to encourage this competition. These are the most flawed instances I found during this gameplay loop that got me to become quickly bored of this gameplay and, really, after an only hour of playing, I felt like I saw everything I needed to see. This brings me to see why this game quickly died out and never grew in popularity, and never built upon its mechanics. Hide and Shriek was never meant to encompass this longevity to its life cycle. If anything, it's only just a quick time waster. Play against another player to get a quick, cheap jump scare. I can see someone playing for maybe an hour with their friends during Halloween as a tradition and quickly forget about it until the next Halloween. It's at least free to play, however, so if you're interested in playing, then you aren't wasting your money or hurting yourself in doing so. I cannot comprehend the time I spent with Stranger Z. This is, without a doubt, one of the worst horror games I have ever played. If not, it is one of the worst multiplayer horror games that shouldn't be in service at all whatsoever, nor be accessible with its shady business practices with the overwhelming microtransactions, terrible gameplay mechanics that are unfinished to where it makes the gameplay unplayable, and constant bugs that cause issues during matchmaking that sees the player get kicked out perpetually. There are a ton of flaws that make this game not only unplayable, but just downright a burden to have to bother playing. Upon starting, you get introduced to a playable tutorial. This tutorial lays the basics of how the overall mechanics within the gameplay function when playing in the game modes that are currently provided. It will first have you play as a survivor, where most of the time, it will see the player and others, usually three, be inside an interior environment, where you'll have to lock up the windows, barricade the doors, and use the computer, which is used as a maintenance system to prevent the stranger from sabotaging the network. Your job is to work together with limited resources that you have, and by limited, it refers to limited uses you have to lock a window or a door to prevent the stranger from entering inside the vicinity to kill you. This leads to the stranger, the stalker enemy that the player, if chosen, will assume the role with the objective to kill each player. Typically, the stranger spawns outside of the building in an open area, allowing the player to have options for how they want to break and enter with different approaches. This can be through a window, a door, or through a vent. With that out of the way, that's pretty much the basis of what the players are working with. It is a 3 vs 1 competitive match to see if either the survivors will make it to 6am, or the stranger will prevent the survivors from reaching their goal by killing all of them off. The aforementioned game modes comprise not only a 3 vs 1 unranked match, but also a 1 vs 1 match called Blitz Mode, which makes the original game mode quote-unquote fast-paced, 
where it amplifies these stakes by pitting a single survivor versus the stranger. The difference here is in having only one use of locking the stranger outside, which also applies to the stranger and how they enter the building. Unfortunately, I didn't see what the other mode has to offer, the ranked 1 versus 1 mode, which is essentially just the blitz mode. Coming off as kind of redundant and odd of an inclusion that doesn't offer anything new to the table, this, in concept, is something that is honestly nothing new nor sounds very innovative from other multiplayer horror games we've seen before. This could be akin to any survival horror game that features zombies, where you have to barricade the building to prevent them from entering, kind of like Call of Duty Zombies, for example. But giving the game the benefit of the doubt, it does see the players have nothing at their disposal, which should, in theory, give this tension and create lots of this horror atmosphere. The problem with this, however, is how fundamentally and poorly executed this gameplay is done, making it borderline broken, unplayable, and just overall confusing to play. In the 3 vs 1 match, I played as the stranger. Once dropped in, I was immediately hit with a bunch of problems such as the movement being agonizingly slow, to where even running was not helpful as you were handicapped with a limited usage of this ability. There are invisible walls that prevent the player from freely moving around the environment, creating confusion and limitations on freedom. The field of view is, for some reason, very blurry and almost blinding, and you cannot see anything in your surrounding location as to where you should go. All of these are not only already bad signs, but create limitations and frustrations in this confusing approach to the stranger's gameplay. I found myself luckily breaking and entering into this house by simply finding the correct window after slowly wandering around after a while, where I basically won by default because all I simply had to do was walk up to the other survivors and press E to kill them all off. When you omit this action, it doesn't give any sort of animation to let the player know they did something, but rather a red screen to create the illusion that you actually did. It's so odd and weird that they couldn't incorporate such depth into this movement, actions, and overall interaction with the other players, but they have all the time in the world to create a battle pass, loot crates, cosmetic skins, and microtransactions. Says a lot about the developer. Anyway, after killing the players off, I just stood around and wandered aimlessly without the match ending, as the game should have done, but it just never ended. I had to quit the session as my last resort, only to find a message where the developer had the audacity to say that I would be permanently banned by quitting a session another time. How is that fair? What if someone had a genuine reason due to personal complications on their end? It's such a bizarre choice to add. Playing as a survivor isn't any different. I played in the aforementioned blitz mode in hopes of the quote-unquote fast-paced gameplay to heighten the movement speed as it's painfully slow. But no. It just only pertains to the time limit of the overall match ending quicker rather than the usual 6am the survivor has to wait for. As the survivor, you essentially just walk around the building to choose a window of your choosing to lock the window or a door and go onto the laptop to close pop-up ads, which is the game's interpretation of sabotage, I guess. My experience was just simply waiting around until the session ended as I didn't find the other player assuming the role of the stranger until the very end, where they too had no idea what they were doing with the confusion that is the gameplay design. And so, after just waiting awkwardly for the match to end as I watched this poor player struggle to figure out what to do, the match ended. I won and got a loot crate box. Cool. I uh, I guess. Against my own will, I decided to try playing one more unranked match of 3 vs 1, but only meant 30 minutes of constantly waiting in the lobby, seeing a disconnection from the server, going back in another time, and going through the same process, rinse and repeat. At this point, I was basically done with Stranger Z, with how awful of an experience I had and didn't want to waste another second with it. The only positive thing I can say about this game is that it is free to play and doesn't see you amount to having to pay a single dollar to buy this broken and unfinished mess of a horror game. Stranger Z has a lot of heavy development it needs to go through and by no means should at all be playable. 
There is a lot of work that needs to be done when it comes to its gameplay mechanics, server issues, and this enforcement of microtransactions onto the player, which gives no incentive to want to further this play session with others. It's beyond me how this game has a somewhat relatively decent active player base when you consider how overwhelmingly negative it is on Steam. I will say, however, if there is one thing that the game got correct, it is becoming a complete stranger to this game. So, what can we take away from this? Well, a lot of these games had a reason for never finding that success, as opposed to the greats before it or after it. Much of this failure in seeing the everlasting longevity and growth in a massive player base was at fault due to a lack of direction. Poorly made decisions on the developer's part when incorporating such bad quality of design into its overall presentation rubs the player the wrong way, ingraining this bad impression onto them and overall, leaving the game without further updates to improve upon it and leaving it to die. Much of these creative liberties can be all single-handedly chosen and thrown into one of these dead multiplayer horror games I played today. They are all not great nor perfect, as they all encompass a flaw to them individually, but even if there was never an identity within the game itself, there was, at the very least, the players to give the game an identity, to give themselves this identity for when they want to be heard and seen by those that are still participating and are active in such a dedicated player base in these dead games. There are a ton more of these games that have become forgotten and obscure to the general public that I probably missed, but these were the ones that I either remember purely through nostalgia or found to still have a hint of life that allowed me to venture back into the better days of a once active world. If you got to this point in the video, then thank you for making it all the way through. This video took me quite a while to make and compiled together and wanted to make sure I deliver, hopefully, something insightful and informational about the subject at hand. If you enjoy this sort of exploration and deep diving into dead horror games, then please feel free to let me know of other dead horror games you know of, and I'd be more than happy to work on a follow-up video exploring more dead horror games. Anyway, that is me. I've been rambling far too long now. Thank you for watching. Please have a great day, stay safe, and goodbye.